Video memory, better known as VRAM, is the pool of quick dedicated random access memory found on video or graphics processing devices. It's specialized over standard DDR in the sense that it's able to clock significantly faster, but has a higher latency than the DIMMs that you'd find feeding your CPU. This leads to a silicon die with an enormous amount of parallel bandwidth on tap. But how important is this metric, especially when capacity is also so crucial? Before we get into this video, I'd like to say not to forget to hit the like button and subscribe, so you'll be notified about all our future uploads. Additionally, don't forget to leave a comment, especially if there's something that I missed. I can't cover every aspect of what makes a graphics card perform the way that it does in the relatively short duration of a video. I more so wanted to discuss what VRAM is, what it's used for, and then how it can affect performance in 3D applications. Without any further ado, let's dive into VRAM and see how it enables the rich 3D environments that you see in modern video games and films. On the most fundamental level, memory in a computer can come in several different types but ultimately perform the same tasks and have comparable functionality. What we think of as RAM is typically DRAM, which are the sticks of ICs with gold surface connectors on both sides of one edge of the PCB. The actual stick that you hold in your hand is just the printed circuit board, and it's the pathways that the electrons take during operation. The square integrated circuits soldered onto the broad sides of the board are the actual DRAM chips, and they comprise of an enormous array of capacitors and helper transistors, that physically store the ones and zeros as electrical charges in the dielectric material. The actual structure of this IC can change pretty dramatically depending on the manufacturer, but the fundamental ideas remain constant with all dynamic random access memory. Alternatively, you've got another type of memory in your system, 100% in your CPU and also probably in your GPU to a lesser degree depending on when it was manufactured. This is SRAM, or static random access memory and it builds the caches that feed the computational circuitry that run your code. This differs from DRAM and how the circuit is built and consequently behaves. SRAM was built purely of transistors, and as a result, you not only don't have to refresh it constantly to maintain data integrity, but you can actually pack them tighter together, though there is still a limit. If you've taken any sort of electrical course that covers capacitors, you know that capacitors can store a charge, but only for a limited period of time. This depends on the size of the capacitor, but it ultimately means that you can't just set and forget, and you need to go through and refresh the cells with a subroutine. SRAM by comparison, you can set a particular byte to whatever value you'd like, and as long as power is kept to the SRAM, it'll be there whether you retrieve it in a second or 10,000 seconds. This obviously has some disadvantages, particularly when it comes to power draw, but it means that you're able to use it in scenarios where you can't wait for a cell to be available and or refreshed. Now, on your graphics card, depending on how old it is, features a large pool of external DRAM feeding a significantly smaller pool of SRAM inside the GPU die. Something like an RTX 3070 has 8GB of onboard GDDR6 and only 4MB of level 2 cache. This hierarchy of memory continues with modern designs, but both have grown, though not exactly proportionally or at the same rate. NVIDIA ADA has grown the L2 cache sizes significantly, while keeping the L1 caches basically unchanged from Ampere. This allows the individual SMs to have a small pool of quick access memory, and then a much larger secondary pool of on-die cache that's higher latency. AMD's RDNA 2 has similar L1 and L2 cache sizes, but then has an enormous unified level 3 cache that functions more like faster standard RAM as opposed to private pools that don't communicate as often. This causes the two GPU microarchitectures to ultimately perform similarly when comparing SMs to CUs, but they do it in significantly different ways computationally. All GPUs, whether it's NVIDIA, AMD, or Intel, all also feature onboard DRAM to function as its own pool of primary system memory. This prevents the GPU on the card from having to use your main system DDR, which would need to be accessed over the PCIe interface. This brings inherent high latencies, so to mitigate this you only need to transfer your target data from your main DDR to the graphics card's DDR at the start of program execution, where it can live in its own bubble. This is where you get the marketed memory capacity for your graphics cards, and for most cards built since 2020 you're going to have between 4 to 24 gigabytes of this stuff. What makes GDDR different from standard DDR is 1. the fact that you can't easily swap it out like you can with something like a DDR DIMM and two, it has different timing and latency considerations than standard DDR. Where your laptop and desktop DDR5 DIMMs physically clock up to 3600MHz, 
their transfer rates are double the clock speed, since it's sending a bit on the rising and falling edge of the NRC signal. This relatively low clock speed allows for tighter timings, which are crucial for instantaneous data transfers needed to maintain a high throughput pipeline. Conversely, GDDR6 theoretically clocks to above 12 GHz, enabling over 24 gigabit per second of data transfer per pin. However, the timings are significantly looser. To make up for this, GPUs utilize several memory controllers in parallel to make up for this high latency with high throughput. CPUs, on the other hand, only ship with two memory controllers at most on mainstream desktop chips. Now, what is VRAM used to store? Well, fundamentally, your VRAM stores everything needed to render a 3D scene, such as geometric vertices that make up the polygons on screen, or the texture data that subsequently shades these polygons. There's a lot of other stuff that is primarily stored on the GPU as well, such as ray intersections for lighting calculations, shader code, and animation data such as the transformations for bones and their vertices. While all of this has a memory footprint, the largest chunk of data by far are the textures. In older games, the engines would usually have two or three different actual textures associated with each material that you see in-game. There are the color and normal maps, but also sometimes a gloss or specular map depending on the effect that the engine is going for. But each of these maps are 2D images, with each pixel value taking up at least 3 bytes, but typically 4. This means that if you want to simply double the horizontal and vertical resolution of your textures, then the amount of raw data that you're having to store is quadrupling. For example, a 512 by 512 PNG, assuming 1 byte per color channel, consumes 1 megabyte without any compression. Increase the resolution to 1024 by 1024, and now the same PNG consumes 4 megabytes without any compression. This may seem inconsequential when you've got cards with multiple gigabytes of onboard memory, but multiply this requirement by hundreds of times and things can balloon really quickly. In more modern games, you've also got several other maps besides the traditional color and normal maps. You've got occlusion maps, mix maps, and then the associated texture data that's being mixed. You can have displacement maps for parallax occlusion style effects or specular maps to create highlights with reflections. There's just so much data that's now being stored on the GPU, though admittedly a lot of it can be compressed with the appropriate algorithm. The obvious solution to this problem is to just turn down the texture quality in the graphics menu, and while this does fix most of the issues with real-time performance, the data is still being stored on your hard drive, and also explains why games nowadays are like 100 gigabytes for a AAA shooter. When it comes to required capacities, I don't think any graphics card that's shipping in 2024 comes with an inappropriate amount of VRAM. There is one exception to this that comes to mind though, the RTX 3056 gigabyte, just by the 8 gigabyte version. For entry level 1080p at competitive settings, 8 gigabytes is plenty, and I think that this amount for an RTX 4060 or RX 7600 is appropriate considering the GPUs on board can't really push beyond 1440p high settings. Other alternatives such as the A750, RX 6600, or the 5700 XT all provide this comfortable frame buffer for the relative performance of the onboard GPU. Even for higher settings at 1080p, 8GB of video memory is fine, but you may notice some texture popping depending on how much cache your GPU has. Most games made over the past 10 years can fit comfortably into an 8GB buffer at 1080p, but these requirements do go up with resolution. Moving up to 1440p, and most of the modern cards capable of achieving decent performance at this resolution feature at least 12 gigs of memory, usually more. I think that 12 gigabytes is plenty for 1440p and some light 4K, but this amount goes up significantly if you're looking to edit and render footage of similar quality. Where I've never had any problems with an 8 gigabyte card when it comes to editing and rendering 1080p videos, I personally need 12 or preferably 16 gigabytes of video memory to comfortably edit and render videos at 1440p and 4K. Keep in mind though that focusing solely on memory capacity can be a trap that a lot of people fall into. When buying a graphics card, the capacity is important, but what's also equally important to recognize is whether or not the GPU on the card can actually render scenes using this much data. For example, the RTX 4060 Ti is, by all accounts, a pretty powerful 1080p card in 2024. However, there's the 8GB and 16GB models, both of which are priced very differently. You might assume that the 16GB model will thus have higher performance thanks to its larger frame buffer, but review data from trusted benchmarking sites are showing that the 16GB model is only coming ahead by at most a few percent in scenarios where the 8GB model is being limited by memory usage. 
The memory controller configuration, including the physical layers and clock speeds, are identical between the two flavors, meaning the only difference between these two cards is their memory capacity. Will the 4060 Ti be able to render scenes using 16GB worth of texture data? Well, unfortunately no, because there's just not enough texture mapping units. But even so, it's still nice to have a larger pool of memory at your disposal. In a few years, I suspect that the 16GB 4060 Ti will become much more popular, but in 2024 it's just not necessary on a card that's up this power level. Another similar card to the 4060 Ti is the ARC A770. I like the A770 a lot more than I do the 4060 Ti, but it's hard to not acknowledge that this card would probably perform the same with 8GB of identically clocked GDDR6. I'm not complaining, as it's really nice to have this much dedicated graphics memory on any tier of GPU, but when it comes to what the card is able to achieve, it seems like unless you're looking at the RTX 4080 or RX 7800 XT, the cards just aren't going to be powerful enough to justify having a 16GB pool of memory on the card. It really only becomes useful if you're gaming or editing videos at higher resolutions. The TLDR of this video can be summarized as follows. 8GB for 1080p gaming up to the high settings. 12 or more gigabytes if you're looking to target 1080p ultra settings or 1440p. And above 12GB, preferably 16 or above, if you're looking to game at 4K. Keep in mind though that the amount of memory your program is using depends a lot on the current resolution and texture quality, and can also change from scene to scene. When it comes to content creation, then 12GB is where I would start looking. A card like the RTX 3060 or RX 6700 XT, though they're in vastly different performance tiers, would provide you the basic memory requirements to make sure that you can run all your programs smoothly and without too many major issues. A 16GB card like the RK770 or RTX 4060 Ti would be ideal, though at the same time it's worth jumping up to a more powerful card that has less VRAM. Additionally, pay attention to the memory bus width of the card, which is typically advertised along with the memory capacity. For an 8GB card, a 128-bit controller is fine, but keep in mind that older 8GB cards usually feature at least a 256-bit controller. For 12GB, a 192-bit bus is ultimately fine, especially when it's clocked quickly like on the RTX 4070 or 4070 Ti, but on older cards you might see a 384-bit bus with a 12GB memory configuration. A 256-bit bus is probably the most common on 8 and 16 gigabyte memory configurations, but is getting more rare on lower-end cards unless you're looking at the RX 7800 XT or the RTX 4080. Beyond that, you'll find 384-bit buses exclusively on modern cards featuring 24 or more gigabytes of dedicated graphics memory. Like I said earlier in this video, I don't think that modern cards available in 2024 have an inappropriate memory controller configuration but by and large the controller widths on cards are shrinking as cache sizes grow. That's all I really have to say on the matter. For more VRAM content, make sure you subscribe and hit the bell icon so you'll be notified about all our future uploads. Additionally, let me know what you guys think about VRAM. In a poll on my channel recently, the 12 to 16 gigabyte option was by far the most popular, and for the most part I agree with this sentiment. That's all I really have to say on the matter. So thanks again for watching, and I'll catch you in the next video.